Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power Our God Our God Above all kings, this is amazing. 
amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Amen. Well, good morning. It's uh, really good to be here this morning. <laughs> good to see each and every one of you. And I uh, want to just endorse the welcome that Steve gave earlier. A uh, very warm welcome to each and every one of you who are here worshiping with us in the church building. And to all of you who are watching uh, via the internet, whether you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube, we appreciate you joining with us today. And as always, if you're watching on Facebook Live, we'd appreciate if you just put in the comment section where you're watching from, what part of the world you're in, and uh, just lets us know you're there, and also we can pray for you. But thank you so very much for being with us today. God is good, and all the time, and that is his nature. Wow, God is good, and it's wonderful to be here. Would you turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 7? Luke chapter 7, and um, I want to read a major portion of this uh, seventh chapter, so we begin at verse number 1. Luke 7, verse number 1. And we read, When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and went and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. 
When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation, has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for you do not deserve to have, so I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pause for a moment and acknowledge the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that you have blessed us to be in this place once again. Lord, we don't take that for granted. We know that it's because of your grace and your mercy and your love that we are alive today and able to gather and worship you. And as we open up your word, Father, I pause for a moment to acknowledge my dependence upon you and to ask for your help. And I pray, dear God, that the Holy Spirit would just anoint what I share so that it would be meaningful and helpful to those who hear it. I pray, dear God, that you would be with everyone under the sound of my voice, whether here in the building or listening via the Internet, that they would not so much hear me speaking, but hear you speaking out of your word into their life and their particular situation and circumstance. So, Father, I just pray that you would make your word very powerful in our hearts and minds today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 The subject for today is do miracles still happen? Do miracles still happen? And this is the beginning of a new series that we will um, be exploring in the lead up to Easter Sunday. Believe it or not, Easter is just four Sundays away. <laughs> it's fast approaching. Yes, give a praise for that, amen. <laughs> And so we begin this new series in which we'll look at the life and ministry of Jesus and each week look at a, a significant aspect of either his life or his ministry. And today we're looking at the miracles of Jesus, which were a significant part of his ministry. The scripture tells us that Jesus did many miracles, uh, some of which are recorded in scripture. However, he did many more miracles than what is recorded in scripture. In John chapter 20, verse 30, it says that if every miracle Jesus did were written down, 
that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And now the Apostle John is using a figure of speech known as hyperbole, uh, because we know, especially today with the internet and, and, and all of that digital uh, media, that uh, you could put all of the miracles that D Jesus did in books or online. But the point that he was making is that there are so many more miracles than what is recorded here in scripture. All we have is just a sampling of what he did. He did loads and loads of miracles, uh, many more than are written in scripture. As we look at the miracles of Jesus today, though, I want us to make sure that we don't see this as just a biblical history lesson. Although we're going to, in the beginning of this sermon, explore some of the miracles Jesus did and what they meant, I want to expand it beyond that to how it is relevant for our own lives today. What does it mean for us? It's great that Jesus did many miracles 2,000 years ago, but does he still do miracles today? I wonder if you are here today feeling like you need a miracle in your life. Is there an area in your life where you need God to intervene in a supernatural, miraculous way? Perhaps you need a miracle in your health, that you realize that whatever the doctors have done is all that they can do. Maybe they can't do anymore, but you need a miracle in your health. Perhaps you need a miracle in your relationships, that there's something going on in a relationship that you would desperately like to see changed. Perhaps you need a miracle in your spiritual condition, realizing that your walk with God isn't what it needs to be and are desperate to have that changed. Or perhaps even a miracle in your home or in your finances. So do you need a miracle today and does God still do miracles? That's what we want to explore in our time together today. First though, let's look at our text. <clears throat> our text for today highlights some of the miraculous nature of Jesus's ministry. And we began reading in chapter seven, the story of Jesus healing a centurion's servant. Now a centurion was a Roman officer in charge of a hundred men. And this particular officer had been very kind and generous towards the uh, Jewish people. And in fact, he had helped to build their synagogue. And so when he hears about Jesus, he realizes that he has a servant who was very dear to him, who needed to be healed, and he thought Jesus might be able to do this. So he reaches out to some of the Jewish elders he was familiar with and asks for Jesus' help. These elders go to Jesus on his behalf and say, this is a man who deserves for you to do this because he's been very helpful to the Jewish community. And they ask Jesus to help him and heal his servant. However, what makes this particular story so remarkable is the attitude of the centurion. When he hears that Jesus is coming to his home, he sends some friends to tell Jesus that he was undeserving of having Jesus present in his home. That's, that's pretty remarkable. In fact, he says that the reason he didn't come himself is because he didn't feel worthy to ask Jesus personally for help. And then he goes on to say, you don't need to come. Just say the word and my servant will be healed because I too am a man under authority and I'm used to telling people to do things and they do what I say. So surely a man as powerful and as important as you can do the same. And so Jesus does that. And when they go back, uh, these friends, they realized that the servant had been healed. And Jesus is amazed at this man's faith. Soon after that, Jesus and his disciples went to another town. And as they approached the city, here they encounter a funeral possession for a young man who had died. Jesus sees this. He doesn't know the individuals involved, but he's moved with compassion for this young man's mother, who happens to be a widow as well. So not only has she already lost her husband, now she's lost her only son. And Jesus, filled with compassion for her, goes up to the coffin and he touches it. And those who are carrying the coffin, they pause. And then Jesus speaks to this man and tells him to get up. And this dead man comes back to life again, sits up and begins to talk. And Jesus is able to present him back to his mother. A remarkable miracle that Jesus was able to bring this young man back to life. And the text says that those who saw this miracle were filled with awe and praised God. And news about Jesus continued to spread throughout Judea and the surrounding areas. Now, one of the things that we should have in our mind as we read the scripture is that as Jesus is traveling from place to place, he's never alone. And he doesn't just have only the 12 male disciples with him. He had many more disciples. And by this time, Jesus has an entourage 
And wherever he goes, people are so accustomed to the things that he's doing, they're following him to see what's going to happen today. What incredible, miraculous thing will he do? But his fame continued to spread after healing this young man. And then this brings us to the third scene of chapter 7. And here we read about John the Baptist, who had been the one who had foretold the coming of Jesus Christ, that his ministry was coming. He had baptized Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. But now John is stuck in prison. And Jesus' ministry wasn't producing the results that John expected. So John sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the Christ? Or should we be expecting someone else? The Jewish people had long expected this Messiah figure to come, but they thought he would come and overthrow Rome, you know, free them from Roman rule and establish a, a new kingdom in Jerusalem, uh, kind of in the way that uh, King Saul and David and Solomon did and return the Jewish nation back to being a superpower in the world. And so now here John is, the one who had said that this Messiah was coming and then announced that he was here when he baptized him, stuck in prison. And what is Jesus doing? <laughs> You know, are you really the one or should we be expecting someone else? And so he sends his two disciples to ask Jesus this question. And how does Jesus respond to John the Baptist's doubts? Well, let's look again at what it says in verse 22. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. You notice what Jesus does there? Jesus responds by pointing to his miracles as evidence that he was, in fact, the Christ. That it was the miracles that he was doing that was a real part of the ministry he had been called to. And they demonstrated that he was, in fact, the Christ. So we can see from this that Jesus' miracles was a significant part of his ministry. And when we look at Jesus' miracles, they fall into two main categories. The first is those who affected people and those who are controlled by nature. If we have the next slide, please. The first is those who uh, demonstrated control over nature. And you'll see there on the screen a list of those miracles. His very first miracles was turning water into wine, then the draught of the fishes, feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. He did that on two occasions, walking on water. The transfiguration of Jesus is another miracle uh, when Moses and Elijah appeared next to him. Calming the sea, just speaking to the sea and telling it to be still. Uh, telling someone to go and they would find a coin in a fish's mouth and then cursing the fig tree and it withered and died. All of these miracles demonstrated his control over nature. Not just the ability to heal people, but that he could actually control nature itself. And then the second group of miracles are those that affected people. And you'll see a list of miracles there, healing individuals with leprosy, which in that day and time was an incurable disease, healing Peter's sick mother-in-law, casting demons out of those who were possessed, healing the women with a chronic bleeding problem, healing those who were blind, healing the men with dropsy, and raising the dead. And so here was um, evidence that Jesus' miracles uh, had control over everything, even nature, but then could actually change the physical situation in people's life. And when we think about the miracles that he did that affected people, there are three types of miracles that Jesus did that affected people. Healings, which we've looked at in this text, exorcisms, when he cast out demons out of people, and then resurrections from the dead. And the two miracles in this seventh chapter of Luke are examples of the miracles that affected people. His healing of the centurion's servant and raising a widow's son back to life. Here's some of the characteristics of Jesus' miracles, and they're evidenced in the two miracles that we are considering today. One, Jesus' miracles dealt with the physical as well as the spiritual. So he didn't just preach to people salvation, but he was actually able to change their physical condition. And then his reputation as a healer was well known. Large crowds followed him because of his miracles. Jesus did not have to be present to heal someone. Well, we saw that in the example of the centurion servant, but also in John chapter 4, Jesus heals the son of a royal official. And that official even says, you don't need to come, just say the word and my son will be healed. Jesus' healing ministry reached Gentiles as well as Jews. So he healed all types of people. 
And in our text, it talks about how Jesus was amazed at the Gentiles' faith, the centurion whose servant needed to be healed. And if I'm not mistaken, there are only two times in Scripture when Jesus is described as being amazed at something. And one is in Luke chapter 7, and the other is in Mark 6. In Luke chapter 7, he's amazed at this Gentile's faith. And maybe one of the reasons he's so amazed that that centurion would have that kind of faith to think that you don't even need to come, just say the word, was because when he did miracles in his own hometown, as described in Mark 6, the scripture says he was amazed at their lack of faith. His Jewish family and friends, the town he came from, they didn't believe in him. They said, who is this guy? Isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? Don't we know his brothers and sisters? Who is this guy doing these things? And he was amazed at their, at their lack of faith. We also know uh, that Jesus had the power to raise even the dead. So even after someone had passed away, he still could have an effect on them. And then finally, Jesus' raising of this widow's son here in Luke 7 is reminiscent of uh, miracles done by two of Israel's greatest prophets, uh, the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha, who both brought a son back to life at the request of their mother. And this is significant because what Jesus is doing is showing how he is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophets, that he is a greater prophet than they, doing some of the same things. However, in both the case of Elijah and Elisha, they had to pray to God and ask for these young men to be healed, where Jesus was able to heal them himself. So these are some of the characteristics of Jesus' uh, um, ministry of miracles. He did it for uh, a particular purpose. He healed many people. His miracles were all across the spectrum of things, things that affected nature, but also affected individuals. So that brings us to the heart of what I want to talk about today. When we think about do miracles still happen today? Yeah, we can read in the scripture and see how Jesus is able to do these things. But if you're in need of a miracle in your health, in your relationships, in your family, whatever it is, can you depend on Jesus to do these miracles today or have these miracles cease? Well, here's the first thing I want us to think about as it relates to miracles today. And the first one is this. We do not tend to see the same type of miracles done today as often as in the New Testament. And the reason for that is because miracles today do not say, serve the same purpose as they did then. Miracles in the New Testament and in the ministry of Jesus served a special purpose. Jesus did the miracles he did to prove that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Now stay with me. I'm not saying that miracles don't happen today. That's a few points from, from this one. This is the first one. But we have to admit that we do not live in a culture in a time or in a church experience where we are seeing the types of miracles that Jesus did on a daily basis. But that was the case for him. Nearly every page of the Gospels has a story of Jesus healing someone. And as I pointed out in John chapter 20, we're told it was way more miracles than what's here. So why don't we see that all the time? Why isn't it that every time we come to church, someone blind doesn't get healed and leave here seeing? Why is it that every time we come to church, someone who's lame doesn't get healed and leave walking or whatever miracle that they need? It doesn't happen like that. Miracles do happen, but not with the same frequency. And it's because when Jesus walked this earth, his miracles were meant to prove that he was the son of God, that he was the Messiah. And we don't have that same purpose today. Another place where Jesus referred to his miracles as proof that he was the son of God is in John chapter 14, verses 10 to 11. And this is what Jesus told his disciples. He said, don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am the father and the father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. And so this again helps us to understand the primary purpose of Jesus' miracles were to demonstrate his power and to reveal who he was. And this was very important to do so, so that his early followers and disciples would be absolutely convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Here's the second point I would make about miracles today, and that is that as Christians today, 
We are called to walk by faith and not by sight. The early disciples and apostles saw Jesus in the flesh and were eyewitnesses to his miracles. And it was seeing these things that convinced them of who Jesus is. That's why after Jesus ascended into heaven, these same apostles were given miraculous powers as sign of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. One example is in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit falls on the apostles on the day of Pentecost, there were clothes of fire that fell and came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues because they needed to have some kind of dramatic physical sign of that presence of the Holy Spirit first in their lives and in the world. So all the things that um, they saw and experienced, it convinced them that Jesus is who he is, and they needed to be convinced because they were the first eyewitnesses who would then pass this story to us. So they believed because they saw, we believe because we put faith in what the Bible says about Jesus. We walk by faith and not by sight, much more so than they did. They walked by sight. They saw the miracles and believed. We believe because we put our faith in what the Bible says about Jesus. In John chapter 20, verses 20 and 20, uh, 29 to 31, there's the story of how Jesus reveals himself after his resurrection to his disciples and able to see. At first, they too have some doubts that he really is Jesus, but he shows them his hands. He shows them his feet. And they had the nail print still in it. They could see the, the hole in his side where he was pierced. And all of that convinced them. But then one disciple wasn't with them, though, a disciple named Thomas. And when Thomas comes back and the disciples say, hey, the Lord has been here. We saw him. He doesn't believe it. And what does he say? He said, unless I see his nail, uh, the nail prints in his hand and his feet, and in his side, I won't believe. So then Jesus reveals himself so that Thomas too can be convinced because it's important that he will be convinced because he's one of these first eyewitnesses. And then in John chapter 20, verse 29 to 31, this is what Jesus said to him, uh, to, uh, to Thomas. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 29, Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then it goes on to say, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written. This is talking to us. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When we put our faith in what the Bible says about Jesus, we have eternal life. God can and still does miracles. But the Christian life is a life of faith. We work, walk by faith and not by sight. So we can't have demands on God that he would do the same things he did in the New Testament for us today. God wants us to walk by faith. But then this brings me to the third point, and that is that miracles still do happen. We may not see them with the frequency and the same type of miracles that Jesus performed or the early uh, uh, disciples and apostles did, but he absolutely is still doing miracles today, including healing miracles. James chapter 5, verse 14 says this, Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, the Lord will raise him up. The scripture says that if someone is unwell, that what they should do is call for the leaders of the church to pray for them. That should be the first thing that we do, to pray. And then he says to anoint them with oil. And there's no magic in the oil. There's no healing power in the oil. The oil is just representative of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But it is to God we appeal to, that he would touch a person and heal him. But as we pray, we also have to pray in God's will, understanding that God is sovereign. And so we're asking him, not demanding of him to do something, asking of him to do it. And there are times when God will heal someone who is near death and bring them back to life. And then there are other times we pray and God has another will. I experienced that with my own father when he had a stroke suddenly at the age of 48. And I remember going to the hospital and, you know, he's hooked up to a machine and everybody's gathered around and our pastor had come to the hospital with the elders of the church and they were praying for God to heal him. 
And I believed with all of my, every fiber of my being that God had the power to heal him. That if he wanted to, he could touch him. But I kind of slipped away from everyone else and went into the restroom. And I can remember, although it's been almost uh, 28, 29 years ago, leaning against the stall and just kind of being in a daze because it was all happening so fast, so unexpectedly. I had no idea that that day was going to bring what it brought. But as I leaned against that stall, I just prayed this simple prayer. I said, God, I sense that you are doing something, that you're involved in this, and I don't know what it is. But whatever it is that you are doing, would you just give me the strength to accept it? Whether you heal him or you don't, his life is in your hands. And I'm so glad that God gave me the peace to pray that prayer. Because I have known of people in that same situation who have prayed, you know, earnestly begging, pleading God to heal a person and not let them pass away. And then the person does pass away. And sometimes they are left very disappointed and their faith shattered and feeling uh, that they've been let down. But although God can and does heal, we have to pray in his will, understanding that he is sovereign. He is the one that gives life and he is the one that decides when life is over. And our hearts have to say amen to his will. And that was one of the hardest things I'll ever have to do being able to just say, God, my dad's life is in your hand, in your hands. And the next day, he was declared that uh, he had died. And uh, we had to accept that. But God had a greater plan. And I can take comfort and joy in knowing that he had run his race. He had finished his course. And God was calling him home. And he's going to do that for each and every one of us one day. Amen. The reality is, is if God healed everybody who got prayed for, nobody would die. Because <laughs> very seldom have I ever been in a church where the people have been praying, God, will you just take them home? <laughs> take her home, you know, that, that we just want them to go. It doesn't matter how sick, how old, we keep praying that God would keep them here. We have to trust God. But then there are times when God does do miracles, and I've experienced it. Uh, years ago, when we were living in Scotland, one of the churches I pastored, Karen, I got a call about two in the morning from a family to say that um, their loved one, uh, who was 91 at the time, uh, had been in the hospital. She had cut her finger and it developed to septicemia and ended up in the hospital. And they called us to say, Pastor, uh, the hospital has just told us to make our way to the hospital because they don't think she's going to last much longer and won't live through the night. <clears throat> so we got up and we made our way to the hospital to be with the family. And um, after greeting the family, I asked, would you guys mind if I just go in and pray for her uh, while I'm here? And they said, no, that'd be fine. So I went in there and I ointed her forehead with oil and prayed over her and said, God, pray much the same prayer I did about my dad. Just, Lord, she's in your hands. But you know, the family's desire and our desire is that you would touch her and spare her and not take her. She lived another 10 years or so. She was about 101, was she, Karen? Yeah, 101 when she passed away. And even at her funeral, we had the privilege of attending that. I was no longer pastor in that church then, but her granddaughter at that funeral service recounted that story of how her grandmother had been near death 10 years ago, and God had brought her back and gave her another 10 years. God has done that many times. And often we don't recognize these miracles because although that happened for that lady, the doctors had said, she doesn't have many hours left. You need to come because she's going to not make it through the night. I doubt when she got better that the hospital said a miracle has been done. They didn't call the TV, you know, cameras or, you know, the, the news people and say, God has done a miracle. You know, I'm sure in her record somewhere, they had another explanation for why this woman had this complete turnaround. And we can be guilty of that as Christians as well, not recognizing all the miracles that God has done in our life. Do you know there have been times when God has done a miracle keeping you from unseen danger? Didn't even realize that there was a drunk driver on the road and nearly came into your lane, but God blocked it. Or that burglar who was casing your neighborhood, going from door to door, and somehow they just skipped your house. And all kinds of examples I could give, God absolutely positively still does miracles today. And uh, when it does happen, we need to give him the glory, which is why you often hear me say that we need to have as many praise reports 
as prayer requests. You know, in many churches, there's five times more prayer requests than praise reports. And it's almost as if we're constantly asking God to do things, but he never does. <laughs> no, but God does. He is doing miracles. And when he does it, we need to give him praise. Amen? Amen. And then lastly, Jesus' miracles proved that he has the power to do anything. That's one of the great things that we can have confidence in and take away from Jesus' miracles. There is nothing too hard for him. He demonstrated that he has power over nature, did all kinds of things in terms of controlling nature, and power over every circumstance in our life, which means there is nothing in your life that's outside of his jurisdiction. Nothing in your life that he can't touch. He can heal your body. He can heal your mind. He can heal your soul. He can restore relationships. You know, the scripture talks about how the king's heart is in the Lord's hand. And as the rivers of water, he turns it whatever way he will, which means that somebody who can't stand you, God can change their heart and mind till they will start to love you. Amen. Amen. That boss that's giving you a hard time and you're just feeling like I'm so stressed, I can't believe how this person behaves, God can change their attitude towards you. That spouse you know, who you keep complaining about and trying to get them to change and do better and stuff. You know what? If you prayed for them more than complained about them, God could do way more to change their heart and their mind than you could ever could. And sometimes the people that we want to see changed, the real change comes when we really give it over to God and say, I'm going to quit talking about them and talking about it. I'm just going to pray, 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 pray. And then sometimes you got to fast and pray. And say, Lord, make a difference in this. If you need a miracle in your life today, if there's something that is distressing you, some situation that you just really want different, ask God to help you. This is what the scripture says to us. He says here in Philippians 4 and 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And when you do that, God will do things that will amaze you. You know, we, we often probably have heard this expression that if there's anything you want to achieve, you got to first be able to conceive it. If you can conceive it, then you can achieve it. Ever heard that, you know, in terms of starting a business or uh, accomplishing something that before you can ever do it, uh, you young people here, you will hear that sometimes in school. They'll tell you that before you can uh, 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 achieve it, you got to first be able to conceive it. Sounds good. But that's man's knowledge, which means it's a bit flawed, because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches is that if you can conceive it, if you can imagine it, it's less than what God can do. Because what the scripture says is that he can do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask or imagine. Whatever our dreams are, whatever our plans are, whatever it is we can conceive in our mind, phew, that's so much less than what God can do in our life. Which is why I come back to this point that whatever we pray for, whatever we desire, what we should be doing more than saying, God, will you do X, Y, or Z? Instead, what we should be saying is, God, have your will in my life. Whatever the circumstance, God, just have your will in my life. Because we could be praying for less than God, what God wants to do in our life. Our prayers could actually be limiting our blessing. God, you see the situation, the circumstance, you know the miracle I'm, I'm I stand in need of, will you do it? And then just trust that whatever God allows is him at work in our life. Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. And then finally, I just want to close by reminding us of the greatest miracle that could ever be done. A miracle that we have seen so often, I'm afraid sometimes we take it for granted. And that's the miracle of salvation. Do you understand how miraculous it is that God can change our heart and our mind and our nature? You know, how many of you can remember the time when the last place in the world you want to be on a Sunday morning is a church? <laughs> remember that? Remember when you had no interest at all in the things of God, just wanted to live your own life, but your whole nature has been changed. Your whole purpose for living has been changed. Your whole desires, all of that has been changed. That's a miracle. Why do we not see that as a miracle? And think, oh, you know, we don't see miracles anymore. Every changed life is a miracle. What is more miraculous than a hardened sinner 
having their heart changed and softened to the things of God. You know, if you've ever stood in a service and the songs that were being played or sung moved you to tears and it started to flow down your cheek, that's a miracle. Remember the time when those songs would have bored you to tears <laughs> and now they mean something to you? That's a miracle. Jeremiah 13, 23 asked this question. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. That's the normal way of things. But thanks be to God, because of the miraculous power of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we all have been changed. We all have been born again. We all have been given a new nature. And that's the miracle that God wants to do in everybody's life today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he can change you. He can make you the person God created you to be. You can be the best version of yourself. If you're bound by things, if you're bound by low self-esteem, if you're bound by sinful habits, if you have no sense of purpose or direction in your life, if you're just unhappy in life and just feels like life has no purpose or meaning at all, you can experience the miraculous power of Jesus Christ in your life to give you a life you never even knew existed. Amen? Amen. This church is full of people who have that testimony, that example, the way that Jesus Christ has changed our life. Just as Jesus healed the sick, he can heal your sin-sick soul. Just as Jesus set people free from demon possession, he can set you free from whatever it is that has you bound. Just as Jesus rose people from the dead, he can raise you from spiritual death to live a new life in him. Jesus can do a miracle in your life today. All you have to do is ask him and believe in him. Amen. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? Just for a moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to just give you an opportunity to reflect on what it is that God has been saying to you today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to speak first of all to those here who are already Christians. God, is, or you've already put your faith in him, but if God has spoken to you out of his word and you just want to acknowledge that as an act of worship and obedience to God and to ask for his help to strengthen your faith in whatever area it is that you need a miracle done, would you just raise your hand and say, God, help me. I need a miracle in my life. Amen. I see those hands to my right and to my left. Amen. Is there anyone here who has never asked Jesus into your heart? that you're not a Christian, but you want to become one. I'm not talking about joining church or getting religion. Would you like for Jesus to change your life and help you to be the person he created you to be? If you would, would you just raise your hand where you are so I can pray for you? Is there one? And for those of you watching at home uh, or wherever you are, if God has spoken to you and you want to surrender your life to him and begin a relationship with him, would you just pray Right now, in the quietness of your own heart, as I pray as well. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your word. And thank you, dear God, for the miraculous ministry of Jesus. Uh, how your son just went all over the place, uh, changing people's lives and demonstrating his awesome power as evidence that he is your son. He is our savior. Uh, he is um, the Messiah that was long prophesied. Thank you, dear God, for the... Uh, your word that reveals him to us. And thank you for how you've blessed us to put our faith in him and how he has changed our lives. Uh, none of us are perfect, dear God. We're not all that we want to be, but thank you, dear Lord, that we're not what we used to be. Thank you that we're on that journey of spiritual growth, day by day, becoming more and more like your son. And we appreciate that, dear Lord. Thank you for those here in this church and, and those at home who have acknowledged that they've heard you speaking into their life today. And for those who need a miracle in their life, I pray to God that you would just strengthen their faith, help them to trust you and to pray according to your will, and then wait for you to make a difference in whatever it is they stand in need of. And Father, for those, dear God, who have not put their faith in you yet, I just pray you continue to speak to them long after we leave this place and that they will come to that place where they surrender their life to you and begin to live 
um, not just in a sense of walking around and breathing, dear God, but to live the abundant life, to live life as you intended. So, Father, just thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your attention. And would you please all rise at this time as we hear our final song. And as always, as the song is prayed, if you just feel that you want to come and just pray before the Lord, the altar is open. Please uh, feel free to do so. And for those at home, you can continue to be in a spirit of prayer as well as we hear this song.
Amen. You may be seated. And uh, we are so honored today to be able to uh, observe the Lord's Supper once more before till he comes.